Birkenau was part of Auschwitz. Birkenau was all the killing was being done was in Birkenau. They opened the gate, it was still nighttime, and they yelled, leave all your belonging where it is. Don't pick anything up. Women and children to the right, men to the left, and I'm holding on to my sister, my sister Goldie, a little brother, Tuli, and we're being just pulled apart, never to see each other again. My sister and my little brother went directly to the gas chambers. When we came to the barrack, the Stuben Elteste, the man in charge of the barrack, walks out. He was a Polish inmate, and he says, Ha! You Hungarian Jews, you think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes that are flying? Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you're told, this is how you're going to wind up ashes. I couldn't believe you mean my sister, my little brother, Ashes? This is the 20th century. How is it possible? You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I had a nice life at home, family of seven, and... Um, we went to school. I, all I know is that we went to uh, Jewish school, to yeshiva, and to other schools. And all I did is most of the most of the day we studied, day and night, seven days a week. That's what we did. Um, my father had a wonderful um, chocolate factory. He was the first one to make chocolate covered wafers like kids can, only in the shape of little animals with tin foil on it. Uh, every day he would come home from work with kids with search his pockets, and he made sure he had some in there. And then he had also had a, a wine and syrup manufacturing. Um, both of these businesses were taken away immediately. Right, right away at the very beginning, things started to happen. Uh, school stopped immediately. We, they wouldn't let us go to school. And on the fifth day of, li of uh, occupation of the city of Krakow, a truck pulls up to the gate. We lived in a three-story building and they started to bang on the gate, and the super came running out. Well, but, but all they want us to know is where the Jewish people live. And he was quick to oblige. He showed our apartment, and there was another young couple on the other side, Jewish, uh, husband and wife, two daughters. The mother gave birth to an infant little boy two months earlier. And they came breaking down the door and beating us, pistol whipping us. We were in bed, 5 a.m. In their hands, they had open sex. And they were screaming, throw in all your valuables, money, gold, jewelry, whatever they can find, they threw in. They're beating up my father to open up the safe. While my father is opening the safe, we hear this terrible screaming from our neighbor's apartment. My sister Lola and I went through the back door to the kitchen, to their kitchen, and we came into their apartment, and this is what we saw. This monster was holding the infant by its legs and swinging it and yelling to the parents, make, them sh make him shut up. The parents are yelling, and the daughters, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. With a smirk on his face, you can see he was enjoying what he was doing. He smashes the baby's head into the doorpost, killing it instantly. It's the memories that won't leave me. I get nightmares 
seeing that screaming infant and that sudden silence, and what came out from his head, my God. My father was getting ready to go into the Krakow ghetto because his whole family went in over 200 to Krakow ghetto. While he was packing, a young man comes by the name of Michael, and he says to my father, Mr. Lesser, you know how I feel about your daughter, Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her. To do me a favor, come to the same community that my parents are moving. And my father gave him a choice to go into Krakow or to Nyepalamitsa, a small community. He went to Nyepalamitsa. So that was miracle number one, because all the people who went into the ghetto were taken out of the ghetto and taken to, transported to Belzec, and everyone was exterminated. It was an extermination camp. So that was a miracle out of nowhere. We lived in a farmhouse. Uh, the, the farmer lived on one side and we lived on the other side. And uh, my father became a little baker to feed the family. And somehow it became a little trait for him and he started to bake for the community. There was a baking of him inside the house where we lived. And I baked with him, I was 12 years old at the time. So life went on like this for about a year or so. And then my sister Lola gets married to Michael. And after they get married, they move out of the house into a duplex. They move into the duplex. One side of the duplex they lived, the other side the owner lived who happened to be the mayor of that community. So one day the mayor comes home. He says, Michael, Lola, save yourself. We heard the rumor there is going to be a podlava, a raid against the Jewish people, either tonight or tomorrow night. So Michael went out and he hired a wagon with a driver and he snuck out in the middle of the night and we left which was miracle number two, because that night after we left, they went from house to house, rounded up all the Jewish people, put them in trucks, and took them to the forest, and the man would give them shovels. They dug a ditch, and everyone was shot. Thousands of people were all shot. We were lucky we left. And the only place we could go was a place called Bochnia. Bochnia had a ghetto. Inside the ghetto um, had a very bad reputation. Every so often, two or three dump trucks would come into the ghetto and there would pull out the children from their beds and throw them into these dump trucks in the middle of the night. You can imagine the parents are screaming for the children. The scream children are screaming for the parents. They filled up these dump trucks and they started to move out of the ghetto. The parents were running behind these trucks screaming for their children. But these cultured people had machine guns at the end of each truck. So they mowed down the parents running behind these truck. That resonated throughout Europe. Stay away from Bochnia ghetto because of these atrocities. But we had no choice. One day, a friendly Jewish policeman tells Michael, my brother-in-law, Michael, I heard there's going to be a, a raid tonight. Save yourselves. Now, ever since those trucks came into the ghetto, pulling out the children from their beds, every house and every apartment had a hiding place. 
they called it bunkers. That's when I found out our bunker was this ornate piece of furniture where you hang your coats and jackets. As you open the door, you push the closing apart and the back panel would slide apart. There was a hole in the wall and there was room for the 12 of us to crawl through that hole and stand between two buildings. Now, the last person would close the door behind them, put the clothing back, close the back panel, and we stood there, it was snowing. Lucky for us, the outside of the buildings were connected, but the, the ceilings were open and it was snowing, it was cold. We heard all night long shooting, dogs barking, people screaming. I never heard such screaming in my life. Towards morning, it got quiet, and we dared to come out. When we came out, this is what we found. We couldn't believe people were laying in the snow, half torn apart by dogs. Some of them were still a little alive, and and blood all over the place. Um, there were people going around in push carts and picking up these bodies and pieces of bodies, put it in a push cart. And then they were taking him to the ghetto square, piling them up as high as they could. And these cultured people came with gasoline cans, poured gasoline over the people, and they started a Bochnia ghetto bonfire, a human bonfire, Bochnia ghetto. Do I have to tell you how it was? That stench, that smell, my God. That was true hell on earth. And we knew our sister was hiding in a doghouse. You heard right, the doghouse. You picked up the floor from the doghouse. There was a step ladder. There was room for seven people for food and, and bedding and everything waiting for them. I went there to see what happened to her, and I was shocked to found out my sister wasn't there, but everybody else was in the snow with a bullet hole in the head. All seven people were pulled out and shot. Now, my sister Lola and her husband were saved by a Jewish policeman, and he took because, anyway, it's a long story, he took him into a different hiding place where it was a leather tannery and a water tank in the leather tannery. They were standing knee deep in water all night long, freezing and lucky. They, they heard the same thing, shootings, barking, dog, everything but lucky. Uh, no one checked the tank and they survived it. I ran away from Poland in a truck, a double-decker, coal on top, between the coal and the chassis. Ten people would lay on the sides, and, and they took us to the border, and we were able to cross, and then we had to cross the Czech border to Hung Hungary, and we arrived into Hungary, um, Days later, it's, I'm telling it so fast, but we arrived in Hungary, it was a free country. This was in 1943, in the summer of 43. And in March of 1944, the Nazis marched into Hungary like they were invited guests. When they came in, they knew every Jewish people where they lived, their address and everything. And within two months, they were already shipping train loads of people to the death camps. They told us that Germany needed workers. 
we will all be relocated to Germany, bring along your valuables so that you can carry with you. Leave everything else behind. Anyone found hiding will be shot. And they loaded us 82 cattle car, pushed us in these cattle cars. My sister and my little brother and I, uh, unbelievable story, uh, but I'm shortening it. We're now inside the cattle car, 80, two buckets of water, the water is gone, no sanitary facilities, no toilets. Uh, one day, two days, three days, those buckets were filled up with human waste and, and they were kept overflowing. Uh, my God, and, and now we were lucky we had bundles to sit on bundles instead of sitting on the human waste on the bottom three days and three nights and we arrived at a place called Auschwitz. Uh, it was called Auschwitzim, Polish on the sign, and it meant Auschwitz. But we didn't stare there and it continued going for another three kilometers and it arrived to a place called Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, Birkenau was part of Auschwitz. Birkenau was all the killing was being done was in Birkenau. They opened the gate, it was still nighttime, and they yelled, leave all your belonging where it is. Don't pick anything up. Women and children to the right, men to the left. And I'm holding on to my sister, Lola, and my little brother, my sister Goldie a little brother, Tuli, and we we're being just pulled apart, never to see each other again. My sister and my little brother went directly to the gas chambers. Um, I didn't know about gas chambers, who knew? But they took him there, and I went with the men instead of with the children. If I had gone with the children, I was 15 and a half years old. I wasn't a child and I wasn't a, but an adult either. I decided to go with my uncle, my cousin. I figured if this is a labor camp, they'll feed you better if you work. So I went with them. And it's a good thing because I went with my sister, they would have sent me to gas chamber. Okay, so I went with them. And now I'm coming forward and I see a doctor uh, asking questions, and he goes with his finger like that, right, left, right, left. That was Dr. Mengele, the angel of death. He decided who should live, who should die by a flick of a finger. So when I came in front of him, he asked a young man, comes to five kilometers laufen, can you run five kilometers, or would you rather go by truck? He said he had a bad knee, he would rather go by truck. Poor soul not realizing that meant certain death, and they sent him to the right. Who knew doctors asking you that? But it didn't make sense to me. I see barracks. Why would he ask you, can you run five kilometers? I figured he was testing us to see if we're strong enough to work. So I tell my uncle, my cousin, let me go first. I spoke German, and I, I, so I went in front of him. Before he asked me a question, I stretched myself out and I saluted him, and I said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und Arbeitsweg. I'm 18 years old. I'm healthy and I can work. So he asked me, can five kilometers laufen? Can you run five kilometers? I said, jawohl. And they sent me to the left. And my uncle followed and my cousin followed to the left. And we went to a big auditorium. They told us to get undressed. Get out of your clothes, out of your shoes. 
and walk over to those line of barbers, they'll cut your hair and then go into the showers. All right, I didn't tell you the whole story because I had diamonds in my shoes. So my uncle gave me those diamonds in my shoes and his son had diamonds in the shoes. They got out of them because we were ordered to. I refused. So I am naked with those beautiful black shoes and I walk up to these barbers and they cut my hair and the Nazis walk back and forth checking us out. No one said a word. And they said, they send me to the bedhouse with my shoes on. If they had seen the shoes on me, they would have killed me. I disobeyed an order, you know, to show an example. But anyway, when we came to the barrack, the Stuben Elderste, the man in charge of the barrack, walks out. He was a Polish inmate. And he says, ha, you Hungarian Jews, you think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes that are flying? Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you're told, this is how you're going to wind up ashes. I couldn't believe. You mean my sister, my little brother, ashes? This is the 20th century. How is it possible? After five weeks, they took us to Dernhau, and uh, it was a rock quarry. As they dynamited the mountain, it was our job with sledgehammers to break those um, boulders into manageable pieces, pick it up and put, throw it in mining carts, run it down to the grinding machines to make gravel out of it, and push those mining carts back. Very hard labor, hard work. I figured my uncle will never survive this, so I bribed the chef in the kitchen with my diamonds to give my uncle a job in the kitchen. He took my diamonds and he did give my uncle a job in the kitchen. It got easier for him. And anyway, every day we came back from work. Everyone had to go in line to be counted. Even the workers in kitchen had to go into the line. So, uh, we came in, line up in rows of five, and they're counting us and counting and counting. Usually they counted and they let us go for our ration and go to our barracks. This time they keep counting. And the commandant comes down with his Fräulein, with his girlfriend says, I'm going to teach these Schweinhund a lesson they'll never forget. I'll teach those pig dogs a lesson they'll never forget. What happened? Three inmates escaped. And because of this, he orders his henchmen to pull out every tenth person in line to receive 25 lashes. So as they're pulling out every tenth person in line, I see my uncle is going to be either a five or a ten. He was in front. So I push him behind me, and I took his place, and I was a ten. They took me in the middle of the yard, uh, they call it, in the middle of the yard, all us number tens, and they brought down a bunch of hardwood stakes, and they brought, brought down a sawhorse, you know what a sawhorse is? And this is what they ordered us to do. Walk over to the sawhorse, tiptoe, bend over, but your stomach cannot touch the two by four. Your heel cannot touch the ground. One man is pulling your trousers tight, 
the other one does the hitting, you have to count out loud. If you miscount, you start from one again. So uh, any, anything, if, if, even if, if the heel touches the ground, you start from one again. If your stomach touches the two by four, you start from one again. The first one got up and he messed up, of course. He touched the ground and he touched two again and again. And finally, he falls. And he falls, the commandant goes over, kicks him in the face, get up. He couldn't. He pulls out the revolver and shoots him. His fräulein, his girlfriend, walks over to the commandant and gives him a hug and a kiss. He just performed a heroic act. He killed a man. Number two, the same way. He too fell and commandant kicked his face, he couldn't get up, he shot him. Number three was a little younger, and he messed up too, I mean, he couldn't. He, so he yelled out, please have mercy on me, don't shoot me. So the commandant says then, stand up and come over here and face me. The poor guy tried to stand up, he takes five steps, his knees gave out from under him, he falls. The minute he falls, the commandant shoots him. Now it's my turn, Ben Lesser next to line. I remember going up to that thing and saying to myself, Ben, this is it. You want to live another five or 10 minutes? You better do exactly what you're told. And I walk over, tiptoed, bend over without touching the two by four, one man is pulling my trousers, and I start to count. Eins, zwei, drei, vier. And every time they hit me, I feel a line of blood coming through my pants. Six, seven, finally, zwanzig, einundzwanzig, zweiundzwanzig, dreiundzwanzig, vierundzwanzig, fünfundzwanzig. I made it. You could hear a pin drop in the camp. No one believes that anyone could survive this. The man who was pulling my trousers says to me in Yiddish, go over and thank him. So I stand up, blood is running down my legs, and I walk over to him, I salute him. Danke schön, Herr Commandant. When he hears that, he puts his hand on my shirt collar, twists me around, facing the number 10s, who are still to be beaten. He says, now I told you it could be done. If you do it like this, Junge, you have nothing to worry about. While this is going on, there's a commotion at the gate. They caught those three inmates. Bloody, you couldn't recognize them. They were pulling them in by the hair, and they came in. And when the commandant saw that, just like a child, get sick of a toy, he simply ordered all of us number 10 to go back in line. And he tells his henchmen to bring in a portable gallow to hang those three men. And then we had to go back in line and watch. If you dare to close your eyes, get whipped. You had to watch how they hung each one. And I remember the third one was a little younger. They put the noose around him, and um, he started to say a prayer. There is a Jewish prayer. That's five words. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elein, Adonai Echad. Five words. And they heard it. They kicked the stool out from under him after the third word, and they wouldn't let him complete. God is one, uh, two words. Um, there was such say this. From Zernau, we marched seven weeks. Seven weeks we marched to Zaha, 400 
and 60 kilometers from Dornhau to Buchenwald. In Buchenwald, we were accepted, counted. They put us in a barrack. We slept there. Next morning, we had to leave because Buchenwald is also being evacuated. So we lined up and they took us to a bunch of cattle cars, 82 cattle car. And I tell my cousin, I push him up, I says, find a spot against the wall that we can rest our back against the wall. I remember going to Auschwitz with people all around you, it was terrible. Anyway, he did. After an hour inside the cattle car, they opened the door and they threw in 80 breads, 80 loaves of bread, a loaf of bread for each person. Picture this, those people who were next to the door were grabbing four or five breads, and I, my cousin, against the wall, we had nothing. We don't know where we're going for how long. So I started to climb over the sitting inmates to see if I can get to the door and wrestle out the bread from somebody who had several of them. And while I'm climbing, this inmate had the pocket knife and he stabs me. I feel a stab. I feel my mouth is filling up with blood, but I can't stop. I have to get a bread. I continue. Anyway, I got a bread. I came back to my cousin. He says, what's happening? He says, Ben, you're bleeding. I put my finger here. It went right through my tongue. I have big gash. Anyway, uh, one week, two weeks, I had enough sense. I rationed that bread between my cousin and I. We ate a half in size of a half neck each day. For two weeks it lasted. Everybody is dying around me, dying. There's no water and no food. And after two weeks, I'm out of breath too. And it, it was another week of travel and we arrived at a place called Dachau. And we arrived to Dachau. They ordered everyone who can walk to walk out of the barrack out of the kettle car. And, and th four of us walked out of the 80 of us. Everybody else was dead. And we arrived inside. And how, what we saw inside is unbelievable. Anyway, three days later, we were liberated. Um, and after liberation, uh, the, Two GIs walked up to me and they handed me a can of spam and they opened it up. It smelled so good. We made a mistake. We ate some of it and we came down with dysentery. My cousin dies in my arm the night after liberation from dysentery. I don't know what he died from, but he died. Why? Why was I chosen to survive? all that hell. The only answer I seem to find is that God needed a witness, someone who can talk about it, tell the story, because most of us couldn't. Even most survivors can't talk about it. It hurts me too, I have sleepless nights, but someone has to do it. And I devoted my life, the last 25 years, I do nothing else but travel and speak on Zoom, whoever have the world listen. Keep the world from acquiring amnesia. Remember, remember, this happened. To